Hello, welcome to Promenade Culture Center. This is Culture Corner. We bring you the authentic stories of creative individuals. Very lovely and lucky to have today with us a wonderful artist, Fatma al Badr, artist and educator. Fatma, welcome. Thank you. And Thank so you lovely to, to find you in your relatively short stay yeah. in Kuwait um, and talk to you today. We're very privileged. Um, with any occupation, any calling, um, we usually like to start with asking, how did it all begin? How, how did Fatma became an artist? Was this creativity something you found in your childhood? Was it supported? Was it discovered by you or others? How did it start? So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, well, it's funny when I booked my ticket here, mm -hmm. it said 53 nights in Kuwait, oh. you know, and, and it felt like a long time, mm -hmm. 53 nights, but fast quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so speaking about my arts, I was always drawing when I was a child. Mm -hmm. I remember my uh, father kept our like first and second grade uh, comments from our teachers, mm. me and my siblings. And uh, one of the teachers said that, you know, Fatma is uh, not so social. Mm. She uh, doesn't seem to get along with the rest of the children, but give her a pencil and colors and paper and she's in her element. Mm. And so reading that now, as I'm older, um, I kind of saw that I never stopped drawing. Um, it was always supported by my parents, who mm. are, I think, my biggest fans. Um, and yeah, I think I picked up painting when I was uh, 15. Mm. Uh, my high school art teacher was very supportive, and um, she taught me a lot of techniques, like grid painting and... Um, you know, how to observe something and translate that onto paper. I never stopped uh, drawing or painting. And so I think I just picked it up more as I grew older. A lot of people say they dislike what they're thought at school because uh -huh. you have to go through a gruesome training on techniques and mm -hmm. approaches. Did you enjoy that part as well? I loved being challenged, mm. I think, as a, as a kid. Uh, my biggest dream in high school was to go into art school. Mm. That was uh, something I, in my head, I thought, you know, I, I'm never going to do it. It's not something that I think uh, at the time, uh, you know, there was a lot of pressure to become doctors or, mm. you know, architects or engineers. So that, you know, that art part of me, I thought I could just take it personally and, and pursue that as a side thing. Um, but my teacher used to, you know, she used to tell me things like, you know, don't follow, follow your dreams. Um, even if your, you know, family doesn't want you to go to art school, you can still pursue art. Uh, and so that's eventually what I ended up doing. I never pursued art in, in college, um, but I kept painting. What did you study? So I studied English literature. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, linguistics in education. And that's why I started to, um, I started my education journey that way. Mm. Yeah. We organize some programs here at Promenade Culture Center that are language programs for children uh, in Arabic. And they're completely thought, so to speak, through art and storytelling uh -huh. and this beautiful approach. We don't believe in, um, in strict grammar, pronunciation and spelling right. rules. Yeah. Uh, because we see children flourish when they get to do things to express themselves artistically. Mm -hmm. So I know that um, you are an educator and that you work with children. Um, how much of what was your own experience can you apply in working with children? And um, is art on sometimes on sideways of that or does it, does it, uh, is it interwoven with what you do as an edu educator? Um, so I think I, um, uh, I, I can always thank my English teacher in mm -hmm. high school for giving me, you know, the, the sense of attitude that I have with, well, I guess the attitude that I have with my children, with my students yes. now, um, she was always very, uh, welcoming, very friendly, very, um, 
interested in each student's personal endeavors and personal passions and things like she wasn't just you know about homework or mm -hmm. uh, doing the lesson she was very uh, interested in who we were as individuals mm -hmm. and I adapted that uh, from her um, I think with my students I I think humor is my number one uh, thing with them if you can make a student laugh uh, and, and they can make you laugh. I think you you establish that relationship with them, and everything else becomes so much easier mm -hmm. right after that moment. Um, if you know, relating it to my art, I share what I do personally mm -hmm. with them, and it, we just have that you know that bond where we respect each other, uh, our differences and our you know our different passions. And I always encourage uh, doodling when I'm mm. giving a lesson. So I, you know, I, I tell them if you, if you need, if you must draw while you're listening to me, please do so. You know, as long as you're listening, do what works for you. And um, yeah, I think I have a lot to think. I have a lot of people to think um, for who I am now mm. and, and how I teach today. Uh, it's not just me, you know, I, <laughs> I think I'm a culmination of all the different teachers that were in my life. Um, to go back to the time you started studying, mm -hmm. uh, what did you do to make sure your art survives this big change? Mm -hmm. So at first I uh, struggled because it was, uh, you know, I, I thought I didn't I didn't have enough time because in high school, you know, you have like certain blocked periods of like, OK, fifth period, I have art. Mm. Um, so in college, I didn't have that anymore. The routine was just disrupted. Were you in Kuwait? Yes. Um, so I ended up having to create my own schedule. You know, at 18, 19, I, I thought, you know, once a week, I'm going to block like two hours of the week to just, you know, dedicate for my art. Big idea for someone very young. Yeah, I'm full of big ideas, I think. <laughs> it's not it's not a good thing. Um, I think uh, I think it's a, it was about discipline, just mm. making sure you're um, practicing what you love and, and blocking that time for that. Yeah. And that is not easy. And uh, sometimes going over these obstacles in order for our passion to survive is um, when sometimes we actually abandon that passion. Mm -hmm. And we speak a lot about that with artists. Um, I think uh, of all the people we've met here at this table and people we meet while working here at PCC, uh, very rarely there is a person who is solely an artist. There's mm -hmm. always something else they yeah. do for different reasons. Someone feels they have to someone is still struggling with the idea of becoming a full-time artist and so on and uh, you recently gave a talk at circle talks here at pcc and i remember how many times you've mentioned that this time for art has to be decided upon and just blocked mm -hmm. within your week and you insisted on that mm -hmm. um so are you still doing this uh, yeah, I, mm. I would say right now it's become more of a, a habit, like mm. brushing your teeth in the morning. You know, it's become so, uh, I don't know, instinctual to me. Like I I don't even think about doing it. Mm. It just happens. Um, a lot of uh, artists say they have become artists with their first exhibition. Was that a situation with you as well? And uh, when was this? My first public exhibition was the one with uh, Sedu House, mm. um, which was 2021. This is 2021. Yeah, 2021. Uh, so right, you know, right after or still during, I guess, mm. the pandemic. Um, and we were uh, asked to represent the Kuwaiti uh, Sedu uh, weaving uh, in a modern contemporary way. And so I created a few artworks and that was my first uh, public exhibition. Yeah. But when was, I was younger, I was always showing people my mm. art, you know? Yeah. Is this, um, there's this question whether art is there if it's not shown to others. Can you create art only for yourself and so on? So I guess there's this uh, moment of, of realization that when shared with others, art really, you know, finds yeah. its own life. Um, I remember your works at uh, Sadu House done for Sadi. Was this your first contact with uh, 
with the heritage of Sadhu in, in, in a professional manner. Yeah. Yeah, that, that residency, I learned so much about Sadhu weaving. And I actually, I was pretty disappointed with myself for not knowing my, you know, my heritage and my culture um, it, to that specific art, mm. you know. Like, yes, I knew about Kuwaiti culture and, and heritage, but not the arts of Kuwait and how rich and diverse and how uh, Incredibly super, intricate and unique. Yeah, yeah super unique is. and versatile. Very versatile. If it makes you feel better, I only discovered my own heritage in weaving when I first came to Kuwait okay. and started working at Sadhu Your House. Own. <laughs> Learning, yes, because yeah. I come partly from the Balkans and weaving tradition is very large and mm -hmm. um, uh, woven uh, art is absolutely amazing. Yeah. And it has a long, long standing, centuries of standing tradition. What I was never really interested or knew much before I... I actually yeah. learned uh, through Bedouin weavers mm -hmm. and contact with these women what weaving is. Yeah, um, I, uh, I think that's the shared cultural reservoir where we all learn something new about ourselves. Or... Yeah. That brings me to the question of cultural identity. Is this something you believe in? I personally only believe in a cultural identity, that yeah. we all kind of share these beautiful different traditions mm -hmm. and that it can only make us grow and learn more if we learn more about the diversity of, of others, especially in cultural yeah. sense. Yeah, I'm, I agree. I think, uh, you know, a huge uh, part of how we react is directly related to our culture. So I think if we understand our mm. culture, we'll understand, you know, why we reacted a certain way towards something. It can be a positive or a negative mm. experience, but the more we learn about other cultures, the more we understand ourselves, I think. I think that's a huge uh, thing I learned also when I studied English. We learned about mm. the Sapir-Whorf theory, which is, are we influenced by our culture or does our culture influence how we think? And so I think it's it's both. Yeah. And now you are living abroad. I am. So how does this contact with the world you probably knew before but you are now part of mm -hmm. a different world in a different space i'm leaving everything mysterious because i want you to yeah. to tell us about that experience how does that reflect on on your cultural beliefs and on, on your art well i think when i uh, when i moved abroad i didn't think i would have a culture shock mm. but the first uh, month was very eye-awakening for me, uh, especially in terms of education. So teaching in a, in a school, you know, abroad is so much different than teaching in a school in Kuwait. Um, you know, everything, the conversations you have are different with parents, with teachers. Uh, there are certain topics that, you know, are in, you know, the curriculum that are not in the Kuwaiti curriculum, mm. um, which I found fascinating. Mm. And I had to kind of educate myself on things that were, you know, not in either curriculum and, and why, you know, I had to really do a deep dive. Um, so I understood more about uh, both cultures mm. and um, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. It still is, I'm still learning about how, uh, you know, children all around the world are receiving, you know, more or less different educations. Mm. And there's a reason why. And it's because, you know, the different cultures that we're surrounded with. Yeah. Can you share more uh, about your uh, educational work here, mm -hmm. uh, where you worked and what you, what you um, were teaching and also what you're doing uh, now? In now. A, okay. Yeah. So I worked at Al Bayan Bilingual School. And I wore many hats. I still do. Uh, but I started as an English teacher mm -hmm. at BBS, um, eighth grade. And then for a short period of time, I was a science teacher for mm -hmm. three months. Um, but that was an interesting experience because I, I didn't know, you know, where my kidney was. I didn't know where my, where my, <laughs> any of my organs were, but I, it was a fun experience. Um, so then I stayed at BBS for uh, four years as an English teacher, working in the English department. And then I uh, became uh, more involved with um, different committees at the school. Um, and so I, you know, I really started to look at innovation in education and how 
quickly that's changing and um, how necessary it was for schools to, you know, adapt to change. Um, and innovation in education is really finding a simple solution for uh, students learning um, and how, how to make education more equitable and how to make it more, um, you know, how to, how to make it adapt to the changes that are happening every day. So our students are all like uh, technological, like they're all native with technology, mm. right? They're born with it. Yeah. And so I think we need to keep up with that as educators. And so uh, learning how to, you know, adapt to that is, um, is really important. And we as educators should be keeping up with, with uh, technology constantly and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Um, is this an easy task? Mm, I would say no. <laughs> no, not not so easy. But I think with the right team and the mm. right resources, uh, yeah. the right attitude, you know, uh, and also asking the students, like, is, you know, is this working for you guys? Oh, yeah. Is it, are you okay with this? Do you want to do it in a different way? And yeah. I remember the best teachers of my time at school, and uh, this was a long time ago. I'm 43 next week. Um were the ones who were open to hear you to, and this mm -hmm. is probably always the case, yeah. to um, not just give you ex cathedra um, lectures. And the education has changed so much. Yeah, um, I was first introduced or I first learned about you through Instagram. And I remember incredibly funny comments you used oh, yeah. to share and make about your work <laughs> yeah. and interactions with right. uh, with students. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that humor is a large part of that. Yeah, um, keeping this very human, close bond with students um, is this something that's working better than any other technique? Do we try to learn who they are? Now I'm thinking of my kids' experiences at school. Mm -hmm. um, or are we just interested in kind of finishing what curriculum has in place? Yeah, I think, you know, with uh, any approach to learning, mm -hmm. um, even as adults, it all starts with your connection or your uh, attitude towards mm -hmm. the person that is teaching you. Um, if there is no comfort, if there's no connection, the, no matter what information is being given to you, there will be, I think, a, a certain like barrier of, uh, you know, a protection that someone mm. builds around themselves. Um, I think number one thing is to just, you know, remove that barrier, mm. connect, uh, create that feeling of comfort. Because when a person is at ease and they're comfortable, that's, I think, when they best receive any information you give them. Um, What do you do to get that connection with students? Do you use art? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I love using art. I love drawing lessons on the board. Mm. I, um, you know, we play games. Like games, I think, are the number one thing is uh, to play games while you're teaching, to make things, um, to make learning fun. Uh, mm. Yeah. So I, I do that. I also... Uh, um, I've noticed storytelling uh -huh. when you were giving this talk at the Promenade Culture Center. Um, you mentioned storytelling a lot. What mm -hmm. is storytelling to you? So to me, it's, um, and I think that's a big point also that I forgot to mention, is when I you know, first meet a, a new group of students, mm -hmm. I tell them stories. And they're usually stories that are about me growing up. So I give them as many stories about my childhood um, or even a story about what I did yesterday. Mm. Uh, and like little anecdotes, like when I was your age, you know, this is what happened to me. And I give them as many details as possible mm. so that they're really engaged. Mm. Um, there's usually a point to my stories, uh, which is, you know, little lessons. Like if someone says something to you that you're, you know, that, that upsets you, speak up. Mm. Um, these are little lessons that I think children should should be hearing consistently, not just once. Because uh, children forget easily, I think. Adults too. Mm. Um, yeah, I I think telling stories, personal stories, is uh, a good way to connect with, with students as well. What is the age of students you're currently teaching? 
Currently, so I currently work in uh, an independent day school in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, the students that I teach range from all different ages, but primarily focused on middle school. Mm. So anywhere between uh, 12 and 14. Tough group. Yeah, the toughest. They're <laughs> bouncing off the walls. Yeah. They're all over the place. Mm. But it's a challenge. And I think I I couldn't be in a different environment because mm. I, you know, I'm learning from them as much as, you know, they're learning from me. Um, they're a tough group, but they're fun. I love that learning uh, curve. Um, I'm not a teacher. I'm a parent. It's different, obviously. Um, but I learn so much. I'm in awe of how much we can learn. Yeah. And how the next generation really is a better one. And I never believed that we are better or the one before us mm -hmm. was better. Not even when I was a child. Mm -hmm. I think this helps me a lot. Uh, moments of humor as well. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. And of course, um, making sure that they understand that um, it is my job to bring the decisions no one likes. Yeah. But yeah. It's it's hard as a parent because you have to balance, uh, you know, being a fun parent, mm. but also like... I think I rely on storytelling there as well. Yeah. It's just sharing openly Yeah, how it was for me because okay. the kids yeah. have... Uh, the kids think, even when you don't try, that you are somehow perfect mm -hmm. and that this is the model they should follow. And it, it is not. Yeah. And they're with me for a period of time and then they'll find their lives. So, yeah, I know. Um, I wanted to ask you as an educator, how do you find relevance? How do you stay relevant? Mm. How do you know you're doing well? So I think feedback hmm. is my number one, uh, my number one way of knowing, uh, and that usually comes with me, you know, asking the students to complete like a feedback form hmm. after giving like a project or something. And uh, another way to tell is to gauge the the attitude of the classroom. You know, if I give a project and while the students are working on it, they're smiling, they're hmm. they're laughing, they're talking about you know, the the lesson and they're meeting all the standards. I think that's also a way for me to tell as well. Yeah. How do you fuel your creativity? Uh, so I actually gave a, a talk, mm -hmm. I think that last week mm -hmm. about that. Um, you know, there are certain, uh, me uh, there are certain activities and, and things that one can do to fuel, fuel their creativity. Uh, and, you know, at the very least, I think, you know, going back to what I said about blocking a certain mm -hmm. time of the week, uh, it's like uh, moving a muscle, right? So if, mm -hmm. if you're not moving a certain muscle, it's not going to get stronger. So think about creativity like that. You have to work on it. You have to um, make sure you're giving it the time. So what I do is I, I journal a lot. Um, I... Uh, you know, make sure I spend time on my create on my creative practice, mm. uh, which in my case it's it's painting. Um, and I also, you know, I read a lot about different artists and what they do. Um, and yeah, I think uh, you know, making sure that you're constantly doing those two things is uh, a good way to start. Yeah. Let's go back to, to art and painting. Um, so you're studying one subject, you're keeping your art alive. Mm -hmm. What, who are your favorite artists? Where, where did you go to, to help yourself in like forming who you are as a painter? What do you so turn to? I really like, um, I, I like painting things that will create sort of a, an emotional response. Mm -hmm. um, I like creating art that's relative. To me, when I look at something that's uh, beautiful or when I think of a memory that was beautiful at the time, I want to cherish it mm -hmm. forever. I want to paint it and I want to keep it alive that way. My technique is in, in no way, uh, you know, perfect in a sense that like, 
you know, my lines are perfectly, you know, mm. drawn and, and uh, my details are, you know, flawless. No, my brush strokes are very loose. My color palette is limited. I, um, I think when I started to realize that that's my way of painting, mm. I looked at impressionist mm. uh, painters like um, Monet and Manet and um, uh, Vincent van Gogh. Mm. So I started to look at their technique. Uh, but I also really like the solitude and the, um, the, feeling, uh, the feelings of Edward Hopper paintings. Uh, he's, uh, he's someone who really used light and uh, solitude and themes in his paintings. Uh, so I, I appreciated that. Um, and so I looked at Impressionism as a whole, and I thought, you know, my paintings kind of do that. They focus on uh, brush strokes and, and uh, co limited color mm. palette rather than technique and, you know, making things look exactly as, as they are in real life. And over the years, um, besides blocking a time when you would work on your creativity and um, getting inspired, um, do you sometimes give yourself certain deadlines? Do you only paint out of inspiration or it also comes as sort of a little task you give yourself? Uh, well, I, I used to paint without deadlines. Mm. Um, but when, when there's an exhibition or something I'm working towards, then that's really when I have to tell myself, like, yes, it's art and you do this on the side. But now it's become more of a professional endeavor, you know. I do have to create deadlines when there's an exhibition. Mm. Yeah. And given how responsible your work is, your daily job. Yeah. Um, do you get to paint as much as you would like? Um, so I, you know, I work long hours in the day. When I come home around 4 or 5 p.m., I'm usually either really tired mm. uh, or... I um I don't really want to paint. I just want to, you know, go out or or see my friends. Um but that's not the case every day. There are some days where, you know, I need to paint to mm -hmm. kind of release the tension of the day. Um my friends know when I'm in this mood and mm -hmm. I think by now they they know to just you know, let that me have be. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh and so I definitely, uh, it took me a while to understand, you know, that I, I do need two days in the week to, to paint. Um, and uh, during the day, it's, you know, I think, I, I hope that, you know, I will have the energy to paint later. But if not, you know, I have the weekends. The weekends mm -hmm. are a wonderful time for me to paint. I like to paint during the, the daytime mm -hmm. too, to get that sunlight. Um, do you have a studio here? I do. Oh, that's very good. Something to come back to. Yeah. So mm. the studio was actually built uh, in 2021, mm. right, you know, during the right before or during the, the closures mm. in Kuwait because of the pandemic. And it, and it came right at the time of the SEDU residency, too. Mm. So it was a wonderful coincidence that it all you know, came you together at the right that. time. Yeah. yeah. What are the topics of your paintings? What do you paint about? Who are the subjects or objects? Well, I think they, I think that depends on, you know, the, the kind of the, the phase of my life at the time. Mm. Uh, I really like to paint my memories. Uh, so a lot of uh, touching on like nostalgic times, um, uh, I really like to paint like inanimate objects too. Mm. So, you know, whenever I see lots of detail or, um, you know, certain things that I find beautiful, I want to paint those. I It's a hard question to answer, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, I think for us who are experiencing your art, I'm, I'm sure everyone would have a different idea of what you're mm -hmm. painting yeah. and what the topics are. But... Um, I think the most important thing about any message of any art piece is that it can be so different for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that you ever painted anything that was kind of programmatic? 
that you did it with an idea of sending a very clear message. Uh, but your topics are very personal, so yeah, yeah, and very intimate. Um, what do you mean by like problematic? I mean, would uh, for instance, um, a lot of painters nowadays are painting things that are related to what's going on in the world. Okay. A lot of painters of the past have, you know, defined their art as sending a very clear message, whether mm -hmm. it is a political or a social uh, message. Um, is this even a job of an artist? Um, yeah, so there are certain artworks of mine mm -hmm. that come to mind um, with any, you know, policy that Kuwait makes that I personally find a little mm -hmm. questionable mm -hmm. or a little funny. I uh, make some, uh, usually these are my digital artworks mm -hmm. that I I use humor to kind of poke at the mm -hmm. situation. And, uh, you know, like you said, I stir a conversation around it. Um, the recent one I think that comes to mind is the banning of the Barbie movie. Mm. Um, I found that particularly um, interesting. And uh, I wanted to question the reasons why. Mm. Uh, not that I'm saying, you know, what any country wants to do is ultimately up, up to them. But I want to create a conversation yes. about it. So. Which is exactly what artists should do. And yeah. we rely on art for that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Any, I think any good uh, political art should uh, aim to spark a conversation. Yes. Yeah. And all of that brings to a like a positive social change in yeah. the end. Yeah. The yeah. more and we I, talk to the more solutions we can come. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I read somewhere that it's not necessarily the art that mm. is the art, but mm. it's the conversation that's had about the art. Like that is where, what the art is. Mm. Yeah. Um, you have mentioned journaling and how important it is to keep your creativity growing mm -hmm. uh, and breathing um, and uh, when I listened to this talk of yours recently you have you made sure you repeated a lot of times yeah even as we were leaving you were saying journal please everybody journal yeah so uh, you said you're doing that um, what kind of journaling is it what are we expected to to journal about or um, how does this really help our, our art for instance or just the levels of creativity uh, i think that what, what journaling does is it uh, it helps you create space for mm. you know to take in more um, knowledge to take in more feelings more thoughts uh, journaling in the morning is a good way to clear your mind mm. uh, for new thoughts as well that come out throughout the day. Journaling at night is a good way for you to just decompress. Mm. Um, and so, uh, you know, because I, I repeated it so much, mm. I think that is like the teacher in me. You mm -hmm. know, I think <laughs> repetition <laughs> to me comes like yeah. so naturally now. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a good way for creatives. And it's scientifically proven too that journaling it really helps you uh, clear your mind and um, it helps you to uh, receive in information. It gives your brain the space. So like when you're, you know, when you put those thoughts out and it doesn't have to be something profound mm. or something like magical or revolutionary. Yeah. If you have nothing to write about, look around you, you know. Um, We're frequently afraid of what comes out we of should, us. yes, yeah. or, or, or even wondering what should we write, but yeah. this is not an assignment. No, no yeah. one's going to read it. Mm. And that's the other thing is like, you're the only critic that's going to be reading it. Mm. You're, it's only you. Yeah. Um, and no one should be reading it either. Mm. These are, these are not to be shared. Yeah. These are for you uh, to just keep. And it's a practice that mm. should come to us naturally. Um, at one point, I know it's hard in the beginning for me, it was, uh, it was hard because I wanted my writing to be perfect. Mm. Uh, but that's, you know, then you realize, why do I want that? Why do I want my writing to be perfect? What's the reason? Who's going to judge it? Mm. And why, what defines perfection? And so. That yeah. brings a relief uh, once you understand once that. Once you understand yeah. that, yeah. And you have mentioned innovation um, in, um, in education. Is there such a thing in art? When we talk, for instance, about your involvement with the um, with the study, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the the exhibition that's basically innovation in how we see sadhu yeah. weaving. Yeah, it's true. Um, why do we have to innovate? 
Well, is it to attract new audiences? Is it to keep a craft alive? Yeah, it's both. Mm. Um, and when we innovate, we're not necessarily creating something new. We're mm. not inventing something new. Mm. When and we, we're not destroying whatever was no. already there. Yeah. yeah. I think when we innovate, we're just taking the old mm. and interpreting it in a new way, which yeah. is what we did with Sedu. Mm. Uh, you know, textiles are, I don't know, as ancient as like... Yeah. As you know, the dawn, civilization. Since the dawn of yeah. time, basically, yes. So um, that's what it is. It's not creating something new, and it, it goes with any practice as well. Whether it's uh, uh, someone working at uh, an office job, or mm. someone as a teacher, or as an artist, when you innovate, you're keeping up with, with the conversations that are happening today, mm. and finding a way to adapt to change and um, making it relevant. I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful that Sadu is a protected um, mm -hmm. skill as well as a skill of a, the actual art and the skill of a weaver. Um, and I think these exhibitions also give it a, give others a chance to become new weavers. Yeah. Which I think Sadu House is working very hard on. Yeah, they do a really great job, uh, even with their program. Mm. Um, they, you know, they give lectures and they invite professors, they invite different people from different backgrounds mm. to talk about said to art and and how to interpret it and what they've done in the past it's a really great program i think it feels that for instance your work that you did your your um, paintings uh, that you did for the residency and um, other people did different things mm -hmm. in, involving music involving building things involving uh, different kind of uh, disciplines is that it's just another beautiful perspective of, yeah. of this art uh, which comes back to what it was, not just a piece to use mm -hmm. in a everyday living, but also yeah. the emotions and uh, thoughts of a weaver. And I think creating this colorful, incredible artwork in the middle of the desert mm -hmm. is just something yeah, that, that must continue yeah, to, to, to live and impress. And that's how they used to tell stories too, mm. like through the different uh, icons or the different images, the symbols that they weave. So. Yeah. Um, I uh, researched a little bit um, and read uh, some of the things you have in your blog. Mm -hmm. Is this a form of journaling as well? Um, do you keep it like up to date? Um, it's on your website. Yeah. yeah. So that's something that I should be keeping mm. uh, up to date more. Um, and it's funny because this summer I, th I said, you know, I would solely dedicate the summer to updating my blog. Mm -hmm. But um, my blog is really a, a more focused about education mm -hmm. uh, and how um, different projects worked for me and how, you know, different projects didn't work and what I did to adapt. Mm -hmm. It's a good way for me to uh, keep my um, my educational, uh, you know, practices mm -hmm. uh, in check. And it's good for me to document what I do. I think uh, celebrating what works publicly is very important. I think it keeps mm -hmm. someone uh, going. Um, and that's what I use it for. It's really just for me to keep going uh, mm -hmm. and to celebrate my wins, to talk about my failures. It's not something that I, I should keep to myself. Mm -hmm. I think I, it's a good way for me to share my resources with other educators. And uh, I've found it being, a, it was a lovely way for me to connect with educators around mm -hmm. the world as well. Because, you, you know, they just shoot me an email and say, hey, I'd like to try this project with my students. I read your blog about it. How can I start? And it's someone in like South Korea or, you mm. know, someone in Thailand. And it, it's amazing. It's, do you feel you are now full of ideas of what you would like to do when, for instance, one day you come back and perhaps continue as educator here? Uh, yeah, I definitely... Um, do feel I mean, like given your new experiences that's what i meant yeah so mm. the more i um the more i i learn mm. the more i think i'm gonna come back and you know uh, try these things when I'm, i'm back in kuwait uh and i will i definitely um will but it's another it's another thing to realize that things are continuously going to change in education mm. um it's never uh you know the one solution because you know i could say i want to take this idea next year but then that idea is going to evolve and change and it's yeah. continuous yeah mm -hmm. definitely um 
art is our main topic. So back to art again. Um, I want to ask you about your future plans. Yeah. Whatever you would like to share, of course. Uh, is there something very concrete in plans or what are your wishes and hopes uh, for your art? Uh, so I'm working on a collection of paintings for my first solo exhibit, very which I'm exciting. really looking forward to. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be sometime in the summer, mm -hmm. next summer. Uh, so that's in the plans. I guess another exclusive news then. Yeah. Now for us here. <laughs> yes. Very nice. Yeah. So I'm looking forward mm. to it. Um, uh, I'm not this going be to Kuwait? be. It will be in Kuwait. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be probably sometime in June or July of okay. next year. Um, I'm not uh, going to be releasing any new paintings mm -hmm. online. So everything is going to be, you oh, know, okay. seen from mm -hmm. the, for the first time uh, there. Um, and yeah, that's that's I guess something concrete. Something that I hope for is uh, more exhibitions in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think sharing my art is something that I really enjoy. Um, it's As really, we do. It's really hard for me not to post a painting yeah, when I'm done with I it. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so that's going to be a challenge for me this year, but I think it's all going to be worth it in the end. Mm. Yeah. Um, what would you like to to share as a sort of a small message to people who will be watching us or, or listening to us in terms of the importance of art? Mm -hmm. We here at the center firmly believe that art will, art will save us all yeah. in the end. And uh, is there an exhibition people should go and see? Maybe a book they should read? Um, mm -hmm. Something small that's uh, like very um, active for you these days or a, a current thought you have? Well, um my first thing is if you've made it this far into mm. the podcast, thank you uh, <laughs> for listening. And uh, message of advice would be to read what interests you. Mm. I'm not going to tell you to read the books I've read. Yeah. Um, but if you are an artist and you'd like something that's uh, not, you know, too, too difficult of a read and it's more of a practice, mm. I would say uh, read The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. Mm. Um, but besides that, read what interests you. It can be anything. It can be a magazine. It can be a comic book. Um, just keep reading. And, you know, don't stop yourself from any creative um, thought that comes to you, you know. And if you get the feeling of like, oh, I'd like to doodle right now, mm. grab a pen and paper, just doodle away. Um, yeah. Or, or write if, you, if that's what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Fasma, thank you so much for a lovely conversation. No, thank you. The time for you dedicated me. to us uh, yeah. while visiting home. And we're very much looking forward to your exhibition. We will be Amazing. there for sure. Thank you. Thank you.